For the last 70 years, both prophets and teachers have been sent to America. Once called New Israel by its founders, America was a nation founded for God and by God. Like the old Israel, it has turned from its foundation and followed the traditions of men. And like old Israel, God has repeatedly sent prophets, teachers and signs to warn this once great nation. Beside the obvious morality shift in the nation, uh, such as the removal of anything Christian from schools and public institutions, America has long been warned about something most of us do not even consider. That is a takeover of the USA by an elite group of people who use the resources of the USA for their own ends. American President J. F. Kennedy lived from 1917 to 1963 and is most remembered due to the circumstances surrounding his assassination. However, his speech on the elite is almost unknown. He had this to say on April the 27th, 1961, at the Newspaper Publishers Association. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. The haunting phrase that those who question the elite are silenced continue to echo within the halls of power up to this time. He was not the only president to point to the undue influence of a few. President Eisenhower lived from 1890 to 1969 and made this speech at the end of his presidency, which seems even truer in our generation. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We now stand ten years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. So that security and liberty may prosper together. Suspicion of the true motives behind the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, and now with eyes circling on Iran, are now no longer limited to just the few. 
Even during the Vietnam War, there was an awareness of false motives. Martin Luther King Jr. made this crystal clear during the following famous anti-Vietnam War speech. The time has come for America to hear the truth. There has never been such a monumental dissent during a war by the American people. There are those who are seeking to equate dissent with disloyalty. It's a dark day in our nation when high-level authorities will seek to use every method to silence dissent. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today my own government. There's something strangely inconsistent about a nation and a press that will praise you when you say be nonviolent toward Jim Clark, but will curse and damn you when you say be nonviolent toward little brown Vietnamese children. There's something wrong with that press. <laughs> this is a role our nation has taken the role of those who make peaceful revolutions impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that comes from the immense profits of overseas investment. I'm convinced we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values when machines and computers profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people. The giant triplets of racism, militarism, and economic exploitation are incapable of being conquered. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. Like the Vietnam's Tonkin event, the Iraq war was seemingly based on a lie. No weapons of mass destruction were ever found in Iraq, nor evidence that it was any way related to 9-11. But over one million innocent Iraqis were killed and the land polluted with nuclear depleted uranium shells which now affects generations of Iraqis. Seemingly, America's judgment does not seem far away. One of the most predictive speeches ever given in America's past comes from the mouth of Robert Welsh, who was an American businessman and political activist. This speech is a conglomeration of the speeches both given in 1958 and 1974 at the John Birch Society. A part of that plan, of course, is to induce the gradual surrender of American sovereignty, piece by piece and step by step, to various international organizations of which the United Nations is the outstanding but far from the only example. Now here are the aims for the United States. One, greatly expanded government spending for every conceivable means of getting rid of ever larger sums of American money as wastefully as possible. Two, higher and then much higher taxes. Three, an increasingly unbalanced budget despite the higher taxes. Four, 
wild inflation of our currency. Five, government controls of prices, wages, and materials supposedly to combat inflation. Six, greatly increased socialistic controls over every operation of our economy and every activity of our daily lives. This is to be accompanied naturally and automatically by a correspondingly huge increase in the size of our bureaucracy and in both the cost and reach of our domestic government. Seven, far more centralization of power in Washington and the practical elimination of our state lines. Eight, the steady advance of federal aid to and control over our educational system, leading to complete federalization of our public education. Nine, a constant hammering into the American consciousness of the horror of modern warfare, the beauties and the absolute necessity of peace, peace always on communist terms, of course. And ten, the consequent willingness of the American people to allow the steps of appeasement by our government, which amount to a piecemeal surrender of the rest of the free world and of the United States itself are with having its foreign policy function primarily for the safety and benefit of the American people, which is exactly what we had done for the first 140 years of our existence as a nation to the incredible advantage of ourselves and everybody else. Everybody, that is, except a numerically small clique of power-lusting conspirators who had somehow inflicted themselves on a gullible world. Runaway debt unbalanced budgets, high taxes, socialized institutions, and now are all part of the American lexicon. Presidents, great preachers, and great thinkers have warned Americans ahead of time of the plans of the elite. They were, however, seemingly unaware of the great judgments that are to come upon the nation with no wars, a nation that says it is great and no harm shall befall it, a nation that even now still believes it lives as the king in and of the world. While Martin Luther King touches on the judgment to befall the USA, it is the prophets of God that have been sent to America that truly should shock the listener. Dimitri Dudeman is one of such prophets. He lived from 1932 to 1997. He was a Romanian evangelist who stood against the communists of that nation by spungling in Bibles. He eventually was expelled from Romania to the USA. God sent him to America with warnings of the coming judgment upon that nation. Lord, what did I do that you punished me? Why did you bring me to this country? I have no money, Lord. I have no food. I don't have a bed to lay my head down on. Lord, why? Why did you bring me to this country? I don't even have a place to lay my head down on. He said, Dimitri, I brought you to this country because this country will burn. So why did you bring me here to burn and then let me die in jail in my own country? He'd just say, this is California, this is Las Vegas, what I have shown you is that Sodom and Gomorrah, its sin has reached God, and God has decided to punish it through fire, and one day it will burn. He came and showed me New York, this is New York, it is also a Sodom and Gomorrah, and one day it will burn. He came and he showed me Florida. This is Florida, he said. This is a Sodom and Gomorrah. In one day it will burn. I said, what will you do with me, though? He said, I told you to be quiet. And he brought me back to the place we left. He said, now we talk. I brought you to this country because I love this country. I love the people in this country. And through your mouth, I want to wake up a lot of people. Again, he said, America will burn. I said, but how can America burn when it's so powerful? He said, remember and tell them. He said, you reach TV stations and radio stations and churches. But tell them everything I tell you. Hide nothing. America will burn. Cuba!
But again, how will it burn? He said, tell them this. The Russian spies found out the most powerful nuclear plants in America are. When Americans will think it's peace and quiet and everything's perfect, some groups from the inside will revolt against the government. The government will be occupied with the revolution and then from the ocean, out of Cuba, Nicaragua, Nicaragua Central America, Mexico, Mexico and two other countries that I can't remember, they will bombard the nuclear plants in America and America will burn. There are many prophets that have prophesied destruction upon the USA. Everything from tidal waves, earthquakes, nuclear explosions, military dictatorship and slavery. Certainly, there have been false prophets and they have been proven so. Some have been correct sometimes and wrong at other times. The following are a smattering of other prophets that have sounded the same alarm. Henry Groover started his walking prayer ministry in 1961 at the age of 18. The following recounts his vision. And the submarines were sitting there aimed at America. I saw them sprinkled all the way across the East Coast. When I saw that, my family at that time lived in Portland, Oregon. I was alarmed, of course, and I wanted to look over toward Portland to see what was going on. And as I looked across the continent of the United States of this globe, I saw the submarines from way up by Washington, the top of Washington, all the way down around toward San Diego, poised in the same way all the way along our coast in the north from the Pacific side. Then something else caught my attention. I began to see radio towers going up all across the nation. And these radio towers, as they went up, the, da -da -da, the dotted lines began going out as though they were transmitting. And then there was an alarm went off in me. They're sounding the alarm. We're going to be under attack. The siege is laid. When all of a sudden I was watching these radio dots going out like the transmitting of a warning. And instead of the people being warned, they sprinkled to the ground like dust. And an alarm went off in me, and I cried out in the heavens, and I said, Oh, God, they won't even know what hit them. And at that time, all of a sudden, I looked down on the eastern seaboard at the submarine, was drawn to that one right off from New York City. And I saw the missile come right out of that submarine, go right up and come right over the city of New York, and the entire city disappears. Then I looked down on down toward Florida. Down there, I could see another explosion take place. I looked across, because of my family being in the Pacific Northwest, I looked across, another explosion took place up by Seattle, Bellevue. And then another one down by San Francisco. And another one down toward Los Angeles, and another one toward San Diego. Rick Wiles is the True News radio presenter, and he's also a pastor. In 1998, he was working for TBN, and he had this vision in TBN's chapel. On the same day, he left TBN. Now, whether you believe me or not, it doesn't matter. I, I, this was, I'm telling you the truth. And I, I understand when people talk about visions that that's a subjective thing, and you have to make your, your own mind if that really happened. But I'm going to tell you what happened to me. It was like a movie screen appeared in front of me, and I watched buildings on on fire big skyscrapers on fire i saw the smoke billowing out of the buildings i saw americans staggering out of the cities their faces were were ashen they were they were in shock they looked like they couldn't believe that they were alive that they had survived what had just happened and i said father what is this what am i seeing and I heard in my spirit, he said, son, this is America's future if your nation does not repent. The following vision is recounted by A.A. A. Allen from 1954. He was primarily an evangelist. Then suddenly I saw from the Atlantic and from the Pacific and out of the Gulf rocket-like objects that seemed to come up like fish leaping out of the water. High into the air they leaped, each headed in a different direction, but every one towards the U.S. On the ground the sirens screamed louder and up from the ground I saw similar rockets begin to ascend. To me, these appeared to be interceptor rockets, however, none arose, however, they arose from different points all over the U.S. 
However, none of them seemed to be successful in intercepting the rockets that had risen from the ocean. These rockets finally reached their maximum height, slowly turned over and fell back towards the Earth in defeat. Then suddenly the rockets which had leaped out of the ocean, like fish, all exploded at once. The only thing I have ever seen which resembled the thing I saw in my vision was the picture of the explosion of the H-bomb in the Pacific. David Wilkerson lived from 1931 to 2011. Internationally respected pastor, he authored the book The Cross and the Switchblade. He released the following prophecy in 1985. America is going to be destroyed by fire. Sudden destruction is coming and few will escape. Unexpectedly and in one hour a hydrogen holocaust will engulf America and this nation will be no more. The great holocaust follows an economic collapse in America. The enemy will make its move when we are weak and helpless. America will not repent. We have a few clues that point to the timing of the attack on America. According to the above prophets, it will be preceded by civil rioting in the US and also by an economic collapse. Both of these eventualities have become more and more probable with each passing year. There are, however, other prophecies that may give us a few more clues to the timing of this attack. The evangelist Alan C. Martin had a prophecy that purportedly shows Obama to be the last American president. In a combination of two separate visions, 1971 and 1995, he describes the following. He saw 12 houses which he believed represented the last 12 American presidents. In the backyard of house number three, he saw a Life magazine with JFK's face on it saying, in memory of dead presidents. In the front yard of the 11th president was a willow tree which represents sadness. Over the 12th house, he saw six stars with one falling to the ground. A voice came to him and said, look to the east. He began to turn to the east, fully expecting to see the Lord coming in the clouds. The dark clouds opened up in two places, and he saw the sun darkened and the moon turning to blood. He believed these signs represented the judgment to come during the twelfth president. According to the vision, we are now in the house of that last American tw president, the twelfth house. This prophecy will certainly be tested over the next four years. Michael Baldia is the grandson of Dimitri Dudeman. He also had a vision that allows us to speculate on the timing of the final American judgment. Here it is. I dreamt I was walking through a sparsely wooded forest, and suddenly my attention was drawn to an eagle flying high above the tree line. It was a beautiful sight to behold as the eagle rode the thermals flying in slow, lazy arcs across the blue sky. Noticing that it was slowly descending towards the earth, I followed it for a long time at its descent not being sudden, but very gradual. Finally, I came upon a small clearing where there were no trees, just some bushes. The eagle landed in the clearing and began to look around, not seeming to notice me. As I began to wonder what relevance this had, a man dressed in white, hands clasped in front of him, appeared beside me and said, Be patient. In due time, you will see the purpose. I was silent as I watched the eagle and was beginning to grow somewhat impatient when suddenly it seemed out of nowhere a brown snake lunged at the eagle and bit down on its left wing. The snake's strike was very quick and very precise. The eagle reacted without delay, clawing and pecking at the snake, cutting deep wounds in its underbelly trying to defend itself and ward off the serpent. Just as it seemed, the eagle was winning the battle and the serpent was retreating. An other serpent approached, red and black diagonal stripes covering its body, and without hesitation struck out at the eagle's right wing, biting down and refusing to release. After a momentary tug of war, the serpent tore off flesh and feathers, leaving a large wound on the eagle's right wing. The second bite was much worse than the first, and for an instant, the eagle was stunned. Then a serpent much larger than the previous two, made up of many colors, slithered towards the eagle, opened its jaws, and lunged, taking the whole of the eagle's head in its mouth before biting down. The serpent's retreat, and the man who had been standing beside me walked to the eagle, knelt down, picked it up, and held it in his cupped hands. This has been revealed to you that you may know. The first bite has been, the second is yet to come, and the third will be its destruction. And that was the end of the dream. 
the thing that I have to point out is that this nation's descent wasn't a sudden one. Once we were a godly nation, once we were not ashamed to say the name Jesus, once we allowed our children to pray in schools, once we were not embarrassed of saying that the Ten Commandments were the foundation of our logistics and of our legal system, once we said that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is our God as well, our descent wasn't sudden by any means. Because there's nothing sudden about how the enemy works. Michael Baldea's vision was given in October 2004. It was clear that the first strike was 9-11. Whether the second strike may have been related to the economic crash of 2007 and 8 is still yet to be decided. There is more to be said in regard to the first strike or to the first judgment that became known as 9-11. A few people warned in advance of this event. Rick Wiles, the True News presenter, was one of them. When I started the radio program in, in the summer of 1999, I said several times in July and August of 1999, I, I said the words to the effect, folks, I don't know what this means, but when I pray... I'm hearing in my spirit, judgment starts in America on September 11. Now, I didn't know what it meant, but I thought it was imminent. That's all I heard. But two years later, on September 11, 2001, our phones rang all day long from people in Dallas-Fort Worth who heard me speak those words in 99, and they were saying, it's happened. 9-11 9-11 was a watershed event, both at a national and also at a spiritual level. Something had been broken in the heavenlies. In his book, The Harbinger, Messianic teacher Jonathan Kahn describes the signs that accompanied that infamous day. He recounts the words of Senator Majority Leader Tom Daschler on the day after 9-11. I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. That is what we will do. We will rebuild. Not understanding that this verse in Isaiah is in fact recounting the stubborn and arrogant response of the northern tribe of Israel to the judgment of God. Instead of repenting of their idolatry, they decided to rebuild even stronger. It was 18 years after this, in 722 BC, when the northern tribe of Israel was finally decimated by the Assyrian Empire. This sign is combined with the laying of the foundation stone for the One World Tower, a hewn stone, and also the sign of the sycamore tree. In the yard of St Paul's Church near the site of 9-11 was a sycamore tree which was cut down by a beam of the falling North Tower, a freak accident. Two years following 9-11, a biblical cedar tree, that is an arez or a conifer tree, was placed in the exact position of the cut down sycamore tree, fulfilling to the letter the words spoken by Tom Dashler. So there you have it. The warnings have been given. The signs have been crystal clear. America, or new Israel, has forgotten and turned away from its foundation, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Many are expecting President Obama to not only win the election, but this, his last term, will be characterised by upheaval and potential devastation. God is slow when enacting judgement on a nation. He has given the warnings and the signs. For its idolatry, its sexual sins, its arrogance, its unwanted military forays into other nations, America has been marked for destruction. Will it survive in any form? Time will tell.